So the task for me was to really discuss the role of radiotherapy and how it's changing in today's day and age for the management of patients, primarily with diffuse, infiltrating, low-grade, grade two gliomas. So I'm not going to focus on the grade one gliomas that's outside the scope of this topic. And I'm not going to uh, focus on the tumors with anaplastic conversion, the grade three tumors. I'll just focus my discussion on the grade two tumors. <clears throat> so historically, we've had a number of options. Surveillance with salvage, which has largely fallen out of favor in the United States. Radiotherapy alone, which is rarely ever practiced. Chemotherapy alone, which is practiced in several institutions in the US, but is starting to fall out of favor. And combination chemoradiotherapy, which following surgery has become more or less the de facto standard. And I'm going to show you why that has actually happened. So let's start by looking at the randomized data that we have available to us for decision making. And I have actually selected uh, five clinical trials here. Two of them are EORTC trials. One is an intergroup trial from the United States called the NCCTG trial uh, and the RTOG 9802 trial, as well as the relatively immature, most recent ERTC trial. So what have we learned from these trials? The first two trials, the 22844 and the, the intergroup trial, we're looking at a question of higher radiation dose. And higher dose is categorically no better than lower dose. So the dose response relationship question has been answered in randomized trials, and the answer is no. The 22845 trial was early versus delayed radiotherapy. Now this is a glass half full, glass half empty kind of an answer. It did not impact overall survival. So early initiation of radiotherapy following surgery does not change survival, at least in the context of this trial, but it did have an impact on progression-free survival and it decreased seizure burden. So depending on the perspective you have regarding the endpoint, this is either a positive or a negative trial. RTOG 9802, I'll focus on this quite a bit. Uh, so I'm not going to give you the punchline here, but we'll look at some of the data for this trial. And then the most recent ERTC trial was a question of chemotherapy versus radiation. The jury is not out on this yet because the trial is still immature, but it's starting to look like probably timazolamide is not going to be a winner in this disease. So what are the actual level one data? These really go back all the way back to the 1996 era when Kareem and other ERTC uh, investigators published the results of the 22844 trial. They compared high dose versus low dose radiation, no difference. The intergroup trial, the NCCTG trial, asked the same question, high dose versus low dose radiation, no difference. So level one evidence, higher radiation doses do not prolong survival compared to lower radiation therapy doses. If we look at the timing question, which was the question that was asked in EORTC 22845 trial, patients were randomized to delayed or early radiotherapy. It was actually labeled as upfront radiotherapy or not, but the vast majority of patients received salvage radiotherapy, so effectively it became a timing study, early versus delayed radiotherapy. There was a significant difference in five-year progression-free survival, a 20% difference from 35 to 55% in favor of early radiotherapy but no difference in overall survival. Median survival was slightly superior, but this was not statistically significantly different. And the numbers of patients who were experiencing seizures at one year following entry on the study was significantly higher on the delayed arm compared to the early arm, suggesting indirectly that possibly control of the disease was lowering the seizure frequency in these patients. So if we take all of these trials and we line them up, what we get is different radiation doses that range from 45 gray all the way up to 64.8 gray. Remember, 64.8 gray is a glioblastoma type dose. It's a very high dose of radiation. And effectively, the overall survival is really no different. But that's not the point. If you look at the five-year overall survival, the numbers are all over the place. The lowest number here is 58% five-year survival. The highest number is 72%. That's a vastly different number. So what's going on? Why do we have such different overall survival results, even though statistically there's no difference between the randomized arms? And I think the answer is obvious. This is not one disease. This is a multitude of disease. 
And hence, the concept that we've been hearing all day today regarding individualization of therapy must come into play, which implies that there must be a host of prognostic factors. So using both of the ERTC trials, Pignati and his colleagues decided to look at prognostic variables, and they identified five key prognostic variables. Older age, greater than 40, which was negative. Astrocytoma histology compared to oligodendroglioma, which was also negative. A larger tumor diameter, more than six centimeters, negative for outcome. Tumor crossing midline, generally a bad negative prognostic variable. And the presence of neurologic deficits before diagnosis. This is a little bit subjective, not so easy to quantify. What exactly is a neurologic deficit? Somebody has one seizure, is that a neurologic deficit? This is a bit vague. But nevertheless, these were the five key variables that were identified, and you could categorize patients into two groups, those with a low risk of uh, disease progression and death, and those with a high risk. The patients in the low risk had up to two adverse prognostic factors, median overall survival of 7.7 .7 years. High risk, 3.2 years. Same disease, same histology, same MR appearance, and yet a vastly different outcome in terms of survival. The implication here is when we look across different studies, it's hard to make comparisons, and therefore randomized data are often useful in a disease where there's so much prognostic variability. The NCCTG, this is the intergroup trial from the US, also identified very similar prognostic variables, age, histology, tumor size being very obvious. So here's an example. A, 40 year, a patient younger than 40 who has a pure oligodendroglioma, no molecular markers known, this is done before molecular markers, five-year oral survival would be 82%. A patient who's older than 40 with astrocytoma, no molecular markers known, five-year survival is 32%. How can we put these two patients in the same clinical trial, one with the expectation of an 82% rate of five-year survival, the other with a 32% rate, and not stratify for these variables and expect to see a difference in randomized trials. It's just too much heterogeneity going on. So let me bring you to RTOG 9802. This was a very intriguing trial, which really had two trials embedded in a single trial. The patients with low-risk, low-grade glioma, so these were younger patients, less than 40 years of age, with a surgeon-defined gross total resection. All of these patients had a postoperative MRI, and if there was residual disease on postoperative MRI, but the surgeon had called the patient a gross total resection, they stayed on this arm. This was the low-risk arm, where patients were simply observed. The five-year overall survival on this arm was 93%, but not surprisingly, if you looked at the MR images and if there was residual disease, that predicted for a very high rate of progression, and therefore the five-year progression-free survival rate was a function of the extent of residual disease. The bulk of the patients went into the second part of the study, the high-risk low-grade glioma patients. These were age greater than 40, irrespective of the extent of surgery. That means a gross totally resected a patient older than 40 would go on to this arm, or any patient, irrespective of age, with a subtotal resection or biopsy would go on to this study. And the question was very simple. Does chemotherapy make a difference? Patients were randomized to radiation, 54 gray, or radiation with six cycles of adjuvant PCV chemotherapy. This was before the timazolomide era. There were multiple reports of this particular trial. I'm going to just have you focus on the most recent report, which was published in the New England Journal in 2016, because this shows the mature data. So this is what we know from the mature data. Long-term progression-free survival of the high-risk patients randomized to radiation or radiation and PCV. Progression-free survival significantly in favor of chemoradiotherapy at 10.4 years compared to four years. Overall survival, significantly in favor of radiation and PCV at 13.3 years compared to 7.8 years. So this is almost a doubling of the median survival from 7.8 to 13.3 years. These are the mature data showing both the progression-free survival on the left and the overall survival on the right. The blue line across the two graphs is the 50% rate the blue lines are patients that received radiation therapy alone, and the red lines are patients that received radiation and PCV chemotherapy. So if you look at the x-axis, it's going out up to 12 years, not 12 months, 
This is not GBM, this is low-grade glioma patients. And clearly, the patients who get chemo radiotherapy in terms of overall survival, even with 12 years of follow-up, they have not hit the median value yet. Of course, the curves continue to go down. That's not surprising. This is a disease that does transform, recur, and progress over time in many patients, but significantly better than the historic data that I showed you earlier. What about histology? If we look at the three groups that were defined when this trial was done, this is no longer a valid definition because the group in the middle, oligoastrocytoma, has more or less disappeared in the United States. But back in the, in the day when this study was done, these were the three groups that were defined, oligo, oligoastro, and astrocytoma. The median survival, radiation alone, 10.8, 5.9, and 4.4 years. Astrocytoma does worse. But look at the median survival with RT-PCV, not reached with, uh, uh, for oligodendrogliomas, with follow-up extending more than 14 years at this point. Oligoastrocytoma, 11.4 and astrocytoma 7.7 .7 years. And if you look at the 10-year data with RT-PCV, almost 80% of the oligo patients are alive, a uh, little more than 50% of the oligoastrocytoma, and about 43% of the patients with astrocytoma. This is the impact of histology, oligodendroglioma versus astrocytoma. I'm showing you the two very extreme histologies for this particular trial. It's almost as if these are two completely different clinical trials because these are very different populations of patients, the oligo patients clearly do significantly better than the astrocytoma patients. So now, with the new WHO classification and the focus on IDH and the impact of IDH, what does any of this mean? Should we really pay attention to this? Or should we insist on having molecular markers and throw all of this out and repeat this study with stratification for molecular markers? Well, we had collected tissue on this trial. So we did go back. This is work done by Erica Bell at Ohio State University. So we went back and looked at the impact of markers. So what I'm showing you here is the impact of IDH1 mutation. So if you look at IDH1 mutation, so on the left are the mutant tumors. On the right are the wild-type tumors. With all, clearly, for the mutation, RT-PCV does significantly better than radiation therapy alone. But for the wild-type tumors, the curves essentially superimpose. So it's possible, remember this is a subset post hoc analysis on a smaller number of patients for whom tissue was available for analysis many years after the original trial was completed. It appears that for the wild-type patients, the benefit of RT-PCV might not be there or might not be as significant. What about co-deletion? Does 1P19Q co-deletion matter? So we ask the same question and now, Look at the panel on the left. These are the IDH mutant and 1P19Q code deleted. And look at the patients that get RT-PCV, the red curve. That's 12 years out. That curve is flat right on top at 90%. So RT-PCV in the IDH mutant 1P19Q code deleted <coughs> seems to be doing well. But there is a difference between radiation and radiation and, and PCV. And the, it takes a while for the difference to appear. It takes about seven years of follow-up, but the curves start diverging after that. For the IDH mutant 1P19Q intact, there is still a difference. So if your IDH mutant and 1P19Q is intact, there still appears to be a significant benefit with the addition of RT-PCV compared to RT. So this is the trial that I mentioned was sort of incomplete in the sense that we, we don't have mature data yet. This is EORTC 22033. And the question that was being asked was timazolomide versus radiation therapy. 50.4 gray versus 12 cycles of chemotherapy. Patients were stratified by 1P status. <clears throat> so almost 500 patients were randomized. And the question was, is first-line treatment with timozolomide superior to radiotherapy? And the bottom line answer is it's not. First-line treatment with timozolomide does not improve progression-free survival over and beyond what radiation achieves in these high-risk low-grade glioma patients. So here are the numbers, I and mean, here are the subtype differences. If you look at the, the different populations by molecular subtype, you see that there is a difference, and the difference is quite interesting. The curve on top, the red line is on top of the blue line. The red line is radiotherapy, the blue line is timazolomide. These are IDH mutant, non co deleted patients. <coughs> so it would appear that the IDH mutant, non co deleted patients, Radiation therapy seems to do better than timazolomide. IDH wild type, 
the curves keep on flip-flopping, and these are not statistically different. So there might be an impact of molecular markers, but there is not a dramatic separation in any subtype. There is not a clear winner for timazolamide for any subtype. What I did uh, for this particular table was to sort of look back historically, and perhaps you can focus just on the bar graph on the right. These are all the different clinical trial data that I showed you. The first bar graph in blue is the median progression-free survival in months with timazolamide alone. And that number is 39 months. The next two are the radiotherapy trials, radiotherapy only, median progression-free survival, ranges between 46 and 48 months. <clears throat> Radiation and PCV is the far right bar graph, 125 months. But look at radiation and timazolamide, 54 months. Now remember, these are different clinical trials. There could be contamination by het heterogeneity, and it's difficult to compare. <coughs> Excuse me. But clearly, visually and numerically, the RT-PCV arm does dramatically better, hugely better. 125 months median survival, com median progression-free survival, compared to 40, 50 months with unimodality therapy, which raises the question whether managing these patients with timazolamide alone or in combination with radiotherapy is necessarily the safest strategy. I'm going to end up by talking a little bit about proton therapy because this is sort of the new tool in the radiation oncologist's toolkit. And the reason this tool has become popular is because of the images that you see on the right. The low dose radiation bath that you see in the light blue colors is excess radiation dose that the patient doesn't need, and you inadvertently receive that with photon or x-ray therapy. But proton therapy spares this low dose bath, and therefore there's potential advantage in terms of cognitive function, in terms of endocrine function, potentially in terms of immune effect as well. Of course, this remains to be proven. This is a paper from Helen Shi from Boston, where they treated a group of 20 patients. It's a single institution experience. It's not a clinical trial. You can't really make much of the clinical data from this. So we don't really have evidence that protons are superior, but dosimetrically, they're attractive. So how do you test this? The NRG, which is the new version of RTOG, the R in that is the R from RTOG, has launched this trial, BN005, which is a randomized comparison of proton versus photon radiation to look specifically at cognitive preservation in patients with IDH mutant low to intermediate grade gliomas. So grade two and grade three gliomas can get on as long as they're IDH mutant. The primary objective is to determine whether cognitive outcomes are superior on the proton arm compared to the photon arm, and there's a whole battery of cognitive testing that occurs on this trial. This is the schema, and there's something unusual, and I'll just point this out to you. If you look at step two, the requirement for eligibility is financial clearance. I've never seen this in any clinical trial before, but this is the challenge with proton therapy because not all insurance companies approve or cover this, and so we have this dilemma that a patient shows up before we can actually have them register on the trial, they have to go through financial clearance as opposed to eligibility clearance. It's uh, the times we deal with. Uh, but anyway, the patients are then stratified by extent of resection, 1P19Q status, and baseline cognitive status, randomized to protons or photon radiation, and they receive adjuvant timazolamide after completion of radiation. These are the inclusion-exclusion criteria. I'm not going to go through those. The statistical comparison requires 120 patients, which will give us 90% power using a longitudinal model to look at cognitive scores at 6, 12, and 24 months. The effect size we're looking for is quite large, it's 0.5, that's a 50% uh, alteration in cognitive function between the two arms. And there's a two-to-one randomization because patients actually come shopping for protons when they come for this particular trial. And with a two-to-one randomization, we can somehow um, invite them to enter this trial with a greater likelihood of being randomized to protons. Uh, unfortunately, the protocol is not doing very well. There are so far only six sites in the U.S. that have activated the protocol. There are 15 other sites where it's in the pipeline, and the accrual has been very poor so far, only three patients. Uh, and the reality of this is doing technology trials is very challenging. Patients come in, 
They say, I'm here for protons, I'm not here to be randomized. If I wanted photons, I would have stayed home. Thank you, but I'm not going on the trial. So this is going to be quite a bit of a challenge to get this trial completed. I understand that there's a similar effort being uh, thought about in Europe, in EORTC, and it would be very interesting if this could take off, because maybe jointly we could answer this question to determine if protons, in fact, help with cognitive preservation. So let me conclude here. For patients with what we call so-called high-risk low-grade glioma, which using the RTOG definition is a less than gross total resection or age older than 80, irrespective of the extent of resection. Remember, this was a definition that was developed prior to molecular marker analysis of low-grade glioma patients. For these patients, the combination of RT-PCV prolongs both progression-free survival and overall survival compared to radiotherapy alone. I'm going to pause here for one second because a question that I often get asked is why not just wait? Why not observe these patients and treat them later at progression? Because really, you're not curing these patients. And indeed, we have two trials with radiation now that show that radiotherapy prolongs progression-free survival, but not overall survival. So radiation does not produce a difference in oral survival. However, with RTPCV, the control arm was radiation. So if we say radiation is no better than observation in prolonging survival, then radiation is equivalent to observation for the sake of survival. In the trial that looked at radiation, a la observation, compared to radiation plus PCV, there's a dramatic difference in survival. So I think we've answered that question. I think if people have residual disease, it makes sense to treat with radiation and PCV because there's a huge difference in median progression-free survival. It's increased by five and a half years. We're not talking about a few months of difference. We're talking about almost a doubling of the median survival. The five and 10-year survival numbers are increased by almost 10 and 20%. And uh, this, by the way, and I didn't show you the data for this. We have published a number of papers on this, looking at acute and late toxicities, including cognition. There's not a significant difference between RT and RT-PCV between late and uh, toxicities and cognition. Uh, the ERTC trial that attempted to look at timazolomide versus radiation, the data are still pending in terms of mature data, so the results might change. But to date, it does not appear that timazolomide can substitute for radiotherapy. And the composite data from all of these trials suggest that we should be cautious in terms of rapidly replacing PCV with timozolomide because there is a possibility, and I take, uh, take this with a grain of salt because there could be quite a bit of heterogeneity in terms of patient selection, but there is a possibility that timozolomide could be significantly inferior to PCV chemotherapy. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. First, first of all, I would like really to thank a lot uh, Katarina. It's an amazing meeting and typically in the state of mind we love. Uh, I mean from uh, the molecular biology to the cognition. Um, many people are there uh, coming even from uh, US or from Singapore. I'm sure that we will continue uh, to build this network. Uh, thanks to young people like you. So really congratulations. When I came here seven years ago, I remember you were still a resident and now what you achieved in just a f seven years is uh, amazing. So thanks a lot. Thanks also to Minesh uh, for accepting to come. I know it's a long trip, but also to have this controversy about not just uh, the radiotherapy per se or the surgery, but the wound management of uh, low-grade glioma because uh, 
we have um, definitely understood that these patients are living longer and longer, which is uh, good, of course, and we are not speaking about uh, glioblastoma with a one to two years of median survival, but more or less 15 to 20 years now. So we have to anticipate uh, what uh, will be their quality of life. Uh, and you know that after uh, 20 years uh, involved in this field, I'm still a little bit disappointed by the fact that in 90% uh, of uh, uh, um, papers dedicated to new oncology, I mean from surgery to radiology, therapy but also chemotherapy um, in fact the quality of life was not so evaluated and this morning we had an extensive session about that and I think it's uh, so important of course uh, to try to understand what the this patient will be able to do uh, uh, through our treatments. And I will show some slides, uh, you know, but I think it was uh, important uh, in order to have the discussion. I mean, before any treatment, we have the habit more and more, at least in this low-grade glioma network, to do a cognitive assessment. And then we have understood that patients were not so well before surgery, before biopsy, before uh, observation, I mean just facts. And uh, it's very important, you will see for radiotherapy, uh, mm, why I show this slide, that uh, uh, we understood finally that before any treatment, when a patient is not so perfect, despite enjoying normal life and just had uh, some seizures, it's related not to the lobar location of the tumor, but the invasion of the connectivity. It's a kind of disconnection, is and syndrome. And it's absolutely crucial for us uh, to understand that, especially when we will go as a neurosurgeon into the OR, because if we cut this uh, uh, connectivity, we will induce permanent deficit. So this is the limitation of neuroplasticity and we will have to deal with that because this tumor is migrating along the connectivity. And we know also that uh, when we model the limitation of neuroplasticity, it explains uh, why we have seizures. So uh, when we start to have seizures, uh, uh, the brain is telling warning. And it's important because we can deal more and more with incidental discovery of low grade glioma. We will not... Uh, um, um, stress too much this point today, uh, but I think that it will be the next step, I mean, in patients enjoying a perfect normal life. Some criteria are very important too, and I will not speak about uh, Pignati, but in fact uh, what we accumulated, and you will see that many things uh, are similar, but not with the same approach. I mean, first of all, the volume of the tumor, and it was demonstrated by Mitch Berger initially in UCSF. More the tumor is big. When you do the diagnosis, more you have a risk of uh, malignant transformation. And it's so important because, as you know, in many trials, we have not the volume. And uh, it's just a bull, and today it's very easy, finally, to calculate that uh, just by using a software a technology. Second, we demonstrated, and especially thanks uh, to uh, Emmanuel Mondonnet, that uh, the tumor is growing uh, with uh, no stable disease. And uh, once uh, you have uh, uh, understood the principle to calculate the volume, then uh, you can wait for a few weeks uh, to months uh, before uh, to do uh, surgery or chemo or radiotherapy because it's not an emergency. And then you will have a kinetics. And Johan, uh, with the uh, series of uh, the REG, uh, the National uh, French uh, Le Grey Glioma Network, demonstrated definitely that uh, it's an evidence if a tumor is growing faster, the prognosis is worse, and then it's uh, absolutely crucial to know that. And nonetheless, it's never done. Why? Because, uh, once again, it's, it takes more or less nothing. You can tell me, yes, but it's a bias. Molecular biology, I'm sure that uh, Monica will speak about that uh, just uh, later. But in fact, uh, we also demonstrated that this growth rate is not related to the molecular biology. So that means that it's a factor per se. And sometimes uh, you can have uh, ID of uh, uh, not mutated, wild type, uh, and finally a very slow growth. And uh, you can say, we'll speak about that of course later, this is the goal. Have we really to treat this patient? Because we demonstrated that the uh, tumor growth was very small. And finally you did uh, a sub -sub total resection in this case, and have we really to treat? This is the question, not to be dogmatic. And if we say, but there is a relationship between molecular biology, the volume, and the growth rate, and then everything is clear. But not, it's not clear. We know also that this tumor are very heterogeneous, and it will be very important with the next, next talk also, because uh, more and more, we started to understand by doing very extensive resection, and not just a biopsy, that uh, in more than half of tumor, 
so-called low-grade glioma you have for side of malignant transformation, explaining why since two years many low-grade glioma became high-grade glioma. But I remember 10 years ago in a meeting in Germany, I said in Montpellier there is no low-grade glioma anymore because in fact in all cases Valérie Rigaud or uh, a neuropathologist uh, found already some foci of malignant transformation by doing a lobectomy and then just a biopsy. We have to, of course, uh, understand that just, just a wait and see uh, with a biopsy is not reasonable. Why? Because in very uh, famous but also honest series, uh, um, it's very difficult in our meeting, our network, uh, to have uh, this uh, control group just with a biopsy because it's not our philosophy that demonstrated that the median survival was around six years, more or less. So exactly the first series uh, you have shown, especially in Pignati, uh, or also in uh, uh, the famous uh, uh, trial by uh, Martin van den Ben 10 years ago. Now we reached more than 15 years. So that means that we double the median survival by doing surgery, but not only by surgery. And of course, now we will detail a little bit more that we uh, deal with neurologist uh, uh, for many, many years. But you can tell me that, uh, uh, because it's very frequent in meetings, uh, in fact, you obtained better results because you did more extensive resection, because in fact, you selected patients uh, who had a better molecular profile. And not at all. We demonstrated that, in fact, it was an impact of surgery per se, because we showed that, uh, in fact, if you remove more, you can live longer, even in patients with 1P19Q not codilated. And more recently, we published this paper just one month ago in Journal of Surgery, my series with patients with uh, either one low grade glioma, consecutive. The median survival is eight years. And most of them today had no chemo radiotherapy. Why? Because in fact, and we did a meta-analysis about that, uh, with, uh, which will be published in uh, uh, one month. In fact, you have different subgroups. One subgroup with approximately 20 to 25 percent of patients dying very quickly like a real molecular glioblastoma with a real clinical behavior of glioblastoma and then patient will die and i totally agree in these cases we would have to give chemo radiotherapy but my question is how to know that and the answer is the growth rate before because otherwise you will have more than 70 percent of patients despite idh1 wild type will enjoy, finally, a normal life, but also with a natural history of a low-grade glioma. Even in some cases, I did not perform supratotal removal. Then they would have been irradiated or treated by chemo and PCV for nothing now, because some of them have more than 10 years of follow-up. And we will be very happy, of course, one day to propose radiotherapy, because I know that uh, we have not cured them. But you see that you cannot say, IDH1, why type, we have to do a tube or 1P92 non-codilated, we have to do radiochemotherapy because timozolomide per se will not be efficient. We will demonstrate and uh, uh, reverse uh, in uh, a few slides. Speaking about the fact that we cannot cure them, we have unfortunately understood, in, except in some cases maybe of uh, incidental discovery, very small tumor, very uh, large resection around and just a follow-up with more than 15 years uh, of follow-up uh, and uh, no recurrence. But I agree with you, it's very rare, 10%. So in other cases, we have to retreat and retreat, re-retreat. But what we can do, first of all, is to reoperate them without adjuvant treatment in the meantime, if you left a very small volume of tumor, I don't speak about supratotorization, so real life, I left 4 cc, less than 10 to 15 cc. Why? Because it was demonstrated by Mitch Berger, by uh, the French glioma network, more uh, recently by the German network. Uh, if you have more, then you have really more risk to malignant transformation. Plus a very slow growth rate of the tumor before surgery, but also following surgery. And if the patient enjoys a normal life, maybe you can continue to follow him. And of course, the price to pay is to do an MRI every six months and sometimes every three months, according to the fact that maybe the molecular patterns say, be careful. And in these cases, we are not totally crazy. We are doing, okay, I understand that maybe this tumor will become malignant more quickly, then I will do MRI every three months, if the patient accepts. 
And in this case, what we can do, exactly what we say this morning, to reoperate a patient before, once again, to do chemotherapy or to irradiate, because you will have, finally, a lesser volume, and the patient will live longer and longer and longer. I mean, in our experience, radiotherapy is approximately done now 10 years after the diagnosis. And we're happy to have the radiotherapy because uh, another question that we ask, uh, is it possible to re-irradiate -re uh, um, while preserving the quality of life? So when you can do, of course, supratotorization, we will speak about that uh, due to the heterogeneity of the tumor, as you know, because uh, it continues to be true. In this subseries, the patient uh, um, did not have any McLean transformation except in one case now with the longer and longer follow-up and no patient died. But what is very exciting, and thank you to uh, John Gooden uh, for associating me in the, this beautiful uh, proof of, of concept, and I'm sure that it will be very exciting to discuss about that at the end of the session. Even if you have a malignant fossil in the middle of not, uh, of course, a glioblastoma, but a low-grade glioma becoming at that time high-grade glioma. And the most important for us, at least, is to ask uh, to our neopathologist by removing the lobe if the tumor at this level was high grade or low grade. Because the most important is not what you removed and you refer to the lab of neopathology, but what you left in the brain of the tumor is just an evidence. And at that time, sometimes you can decide true stories, of course, not to do chemo and oriotherapy from now in order, once again, to keep this power, these weapons for the next, next future. And sometimes the tumor will finally come back just in one to two years and you lost nothing, but you win nothing, but sometimes the tumor will come back five to ten years later. And suddenly you said how it would have been possible a priori to identify this patient, not for treating him, but to avoid to treating him. For instance, in this case, I was crazy in 2002, to be honest, because, of course, it was a high-grade glioma, you can see by yourself in the middle, but I did a very extensive resection, and I said, I don't want for this patient to be treated. Of course, I exposed to the patient by telling, maybe uh, we have to do chemo radiotherapy, maybe we don't know, maybe we will follow you. And in fact, uh, I did a second surgery just uh, nine months ago, and uh, this patient, as you can see, in fact, had never chemo radiotherapy, enjoyed a normal life for 15 years. I can tell you that uh, her son is now uh, uh, um, in medicine uh, university uh, in Bordeaux. So I know many things about them because I, has, uh, I am like uh, a family doctor. But in fact, today, what was exciting is that it was a low-grade glioma according to the new classification 15 years after the first realization where at that time it was a high-grade glioma. So demonstrating that we change radically the natural history of the disease. You will tell me, beautiful case, but we have now 70 cases, 7-0 like this, and of course the goal is uh, with family dialects uh, to do the job uh, in order to publish the paper and to say we can change radically the natural history of the disease, not by telling that surgery is the solution, but sometimes be quiet following surgery by doing observation and then adapt yourself and definitely molecular biology is maybe just a part of the history, crucial but not the absolute variable. Now, radiotherapists will have a problem with us, I mean, because we will do a supratotorization, I mean, not speaking about uh, oncological issues in all cases, we have to be humble, but regarding the functional issues because we will stop our resection according to the functional boundaries, the connectome. We discussed about that this morning, projection fibers, association fibers. In other words, what you will have to radiate is the connectivity. And why we stopped at this level? Because it's the minimal common brain. If you cut it, you induce permanent deficit. So the question will be today again and again, and tomorrow morning, of course, is it possible to treat the brain and not just to do surgery within the brain, but also to do chemo radiotherapy to discuss all together if we don't know the functional anatomy of the brain, because we have to be also specialists 
of organ and not just a methodology. I am a good surgeon, you are a good technologist regarding the radiation therapy, I am a good oncologist regarding uh, the drugs and so on. No, 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 we have to speak about the brain itself. And of course we need to know the enemy, this tumor at that time, this patient, according to from the volume to the molecular biology, but also according to the minimal common brain and the fact that we know now that if we cut some pathways, we will induce permanent deficit. It's true for surgery. The question is, is it true also for radiotherapy? Not speaking about one year later, but 15 years later. And of course, uh, I showed this uh, um, slide speaking about radiotherapy per se, and not to say that radiotherapy has no interest, but maybe early radiotherapy, and it will be the question, because you cannot do radiotherapy and again to irradiate, or of course, in some cases, maybe. So the question will be finally when to use this ACE. And speaking about uh, PCV plus radiotherapy, our problem, because I know I'm not the sole, not just in this room, but that there was no objective evaluation of uh, exonterization, and, and we demonstrated definitely that surgery is absolutely crucial. And only 9 to 11 percent, 10 percent of patients had a total resection, which is not our rate today in uh, at least uh, this network. We are around 30. Speaking about total resection. Chemotherapy alone, I will not discuss about that, but just in order to say not for radiotherapists but for oncologists, you are telling us you have no randomized trial demonstrating definitely according to the computer in Stockholm that you have to operate versus not operate and so on and so on. But finally, you never did that PCV compared to temozolomide. Why? I mean, first of all, do the try for you, and then we will discuss all together, speaking about what we have to administrate following surgery, because of course, what we prefer is just temozolomide, and do you know why? Because the quality of life. And finally, the selection, empirically, more and more, at least in Europe and uh, colleagues I know, uh, uh, in favor of temozolomide, not because it was demonstrated, but just because the quality of life is better because the reverse was not demonstrated. I mean, PCV is uh, more efficient than uh, uh, temozolomide. Show me a try demonstrating that. The third point, and this is probably the most important, once again, the first slide, the quality of life of patient and the cognitive scores, but not just regarding the next five years, but now regarding the next 10, 15, and why not, 20 years. And definitely, I think that it's very important for all oncologists, not just surgeons, to understand, and I will say that again and again and again, that uh, if we cut the connectivity, the patient will not recover. So the question will be if we radiate this connectivity, including using new methodology, IMRT, uh, maybe a proton, and so on. And then I'm not, of course, uh, the good uh, one to answer this question, but I can read the literature. And what they said in very recent papers, that uh, if you use partial brain irradiation, so not uh, using the classical uh, irradiation uh, we spoke about 20 years ago, you can start to have, uh, by correlating to the white matter DTI, and we know that because we spoke a lot about that this morning, that we can predict decline in verbal frequency just 18 months after radiotherapy. Which makes sense, I mean, if we radiate the connectivity because we remove the tumor, not in this case, of course, but now we have to translate to the gray glioma and we have to demonstrate, I don't know, it's just a question. You have a risk to see also a disconnection in the syndrome occurring, but not five to ten years later, but finally very quickly. And it was also demonstrated, at least not demonstrated, but more and more evoked in a, a paper this year using tractography. And you will see that it's very important because I spoke about the fact that the minimal common core will be, in fact, what you will have to radiate if we do the surgery according to the functional boundaries. So it will be more and more complex for you because, in fact, you will not have to radiate the tumor anymore, but just the white matter tract invaded by uh, tumoral cells, which is not the same um, challenge, especially if you want to anticipate for the next 10 to 15 years. And you can see that again, everything started to be significant after one year. So 
what I will propose is, of course, it's a prospective collection of data, and especially because you will have this opportunity, why not, with proton therapy. But I mean by doing DTI, which is very easy to uh, perform, knowing that regarding now the oncological issues, and it's not from our data bank in order uh, to show that uh, we have the same question. Today, more or less everywhere in the world, it's from the US National Cancer Database. You know probably these two papers about 1,000 patients, so we will say, okay, it's not prospective randomized trial, but nonetheless, no long-term overall survival was uh, seen in patients with high-risk grade two gliomas treated with chemotherapy versus chemo radiotherapy. And another one published very recently also, about 2,000 low-grade glioma, chemotherapy alone was independently associated with longer overall survival with compared with radiotherapy alone in patients with low-grade gliomas who underwent surgery. So once again, the question is, have we really to treat by radiotherapy in all cases, and this is my point, according to the evidence-based medicine today? knowing that we have also an alternative. I mean, sometimes, uh, okay, we like to pray to induce plasticity, blah, blah, but uh, we cannot, because there is an invasion of why matter tract. And in this case, what we can do? Chemotherapy. And chemotherapy will induce, in uh, more than 50% of cases, a shrinkage. I am very, very kind by, by telling just uh, more than 50% of cases. Why? Because we don't use the RHINO criteria. We spoke about that this morning too. Because the goal is to say, have you a decrease of the volume objectively? Yes, no. What is crazy is that we have sometimes in some tumor board to fight really against the RHINO criteria because this is a kind of Bible. Why we are just speaking about the truth, the volume now and the volume six to 12 months after administration of temozolomine. And if the volume is decreasing, that means that we have an impact. Yes, but according to the Ranio criteria, the uh, decrease was just a 15%. This is a decrease of 15%. We have to call a cut a cut. And it's not done in many of trials today. In other words, we will have to say, according to the Rhino criteria, in fact, it does not work because it did not reach under a threshold of minus 20 to 25 percent of the volume. And we will explain that to the fact that it was not 1P92 correlated, when in fact, you have in more than 50 percent of cases a, an objective decrease of the volume despite the fact that we have no 1P92 codeletion. It's not my experience. It's just that I am observing what I learn from chemotherapists when I ask them, oh, please, can you definitely do chemotherapy, temozolomide versus PCV? Once again, I will not decide by myself, but uh, uh, it's the good timing to give treatment. And you can see a decrease independently of the molecular biology, because you can see here we reported that uh, while, while I was still in the Petit Salpetrier Hospital in Paris, 50% of 1P9QQ non codeleted uh, diffuse low grade lemma with minor or partial responses under temozolomide. But with no adverse cognitive effect. And I can tell you that today because we have now more than 15 years of that. And we did the objective assessment. And what happened after temozolomide, plus minus surgery independently, no problems. Even with a long term flap. So it's not just maybe a dream, it's demonstrated. Yes, it was not prospective randomized. We cannot randomize that because we know that we have to preserve the connectome. And this is the reason why we propose with uh, my colleague, Luc Taillandier, uh, a famous neuro-oncologist, but also more recently with uh, Emmanuel Mondonnet, this, uh, what he loved to call the recursive approach. I mean, you have a low-grade glioma. First of all, you decrease the volume and you do surgery. But after cognitive assessment, after, if you want, also fMRI, magnetoencephalography, and so on, and so on, to better understand mechanisms underlying plasticity. But also after calculating the volume and the growth rate. And now you have already prognosis of this tumor at that time in this patient independently of the molecular biology. And now you can add the
the molecular biology because you will do a very extensive resection and the neuropathologist uh, love or hate you because uh, they will have uh, uh, many samples but also a lot of uh, sometimes uh, and then they can do what they want I mean in order to explain to us if there is a heterogeneity or not or modification of the neuropathological or the molecular profile from one surgery to another one uh, many years later and then when you cannot reoperate to do chemotherapy once again PCV versus temozolomide I don't know but your oncologists have to do the job, a prospective randomized trial. And finally, to keep maybe radiotherapy, not maybe, because one day I know that this patient will have a rare, rare, rare recurrence. And at that time, you will have, in fact, a two radiate. I'm sorry about that, but the worst part of the brain, the not plastic at all. But we will have to deal, maybe you will have to deal with the, the the dosage, and it will be the, the, the discussion, of course, according to the invasion of this minimal common brain. According to that, it's not yet published, but today I can tell you that with at least a subgroup of patients with Luc Tayonzi, and you see that it's not just a surgery, and most of our patients finally have been irradiated, but they enjoy a normal life, at least in the first of 10 to 15 years, and the median survival is 17 years. And of course, molecular biology is important, but it's just a part of the history. I mean, astrocytoma in this subgroup, we have nonetheless 15 years of median survival. If they are oligodendroglioma, we have almost 20 years now of median survival. So, of course, it's a part of the history, but nonetheless, even in astrocytoma and IDH1 non mutated, we changed radically the natural history of the disease, not against the quality of life, or even better. So I'm sure that uh, Monica will uh, comment about that in, his in her talk. But I was so happy when you sent me, and to Emmanuel also in January, I remember uh, this proof. Because finally, I don't want to be dogmatic by, the, by telling that YP and INQ wouldn't care, but uh, I changed nothing in your comment, regardless. I said that it's not the Bible. And for 90% of the oncologists in the world, actually, in tumor board, if you have no 1P90 Q codilated, we have to radiate. Because we know that, of course, temozolomide will not work. No, in fact, you demonstrated that maybe it's a little bit more complex, according now to the MGMT. And it's not me, but to defer radiotherapy for long-term preservation of cognitive function and quality of life. And once again, the goal is not to say you have not to radiate. We have to select each patient according to a big equation, which is much more complex and not just less than 40 years, more than 40 years, we have not to irradiate because you did a complete resection in the first case, or we have to irradiate in the second case. And to be honest, I joked sometimes in operating theater, I don't know if it's really a joke, but some patients I did surgery 10 years later, for instance, this patient, and finally, I said, because the patient was a, a 30 initially, I did a complete resection according to postoperative MRI, even if I did not cure her, of course. No radiotherapy. But now she's 45. So even if finally the molecular biology is the same, I mean, in this case, uh, to be honest, it was on one pin, I think you could delete it. But with uh, no foci of magdalene transformation in comparison to, for, to the first time, have we to give radiotherapy plus PCV just because she's more than 40 today. You have seen that sometimes it's really crazy because uh, if you start to apply the protocol, you have a risk uh, maybe to not consider the patient herself anymore. And the truth is probably just in between. So my take home message will be that beyond surgery, which I've understood that of course a supramaximal resection or at least a subtotal resection, sometimes we have to be more humble. We change the natural history of the disease, but it's not related to the molecular profile. And then we will have to discuss. And this is what we love to uh, apply as a protocol in our department uh, or network for many years, uh, 20 years. Our protocol is that we have no protocol. And for each patient, we will say, are you really true that because now is 55, 50, we have to treat? 
Post-operative tumoral volume is very important, but of course uh, we have to see the growth rate. And if you know the growth rate before to go to the ER, you know already finally if you have to treat or not. But also this pattern of uh, invasion, subcortical connectivity, which is true for the surgeon, once again, is true for the radiotherapist. In fact, just new oncologists they don't care more or less because in all cases you can administrate chemotherapy and uh, you will not induce cognitive disorders uh, despite the location of the tumor. And this heterogeneity explaining why today we have to be careful about the new classification because you know that if you have a focus of glioblastoma in the middle of the tumor, while everywhere it was a low-grade glioma and you did a supratotalization in a 30-year-old uh, patient, then you have to treat. Why? And in all cases, at least in my opinion, but I think I'm not the sole, in trials, today the median survival should not be the first endpoint anymore, in low-grade glioma at least. I don't speak about glioblastoma, but the quality of life. Why? Because if your patients are well, that means that in essence they are alive. The reverse is not true. The other point is that uh, you can have this chemotherapy with uh, so a shrinkage not recognized by the official RHINO criteria today. So be objective by calculating the volume. It's true for the oncologist too. And continuing to do the cognitive assessment during and after chemotherapy and radiotherapy, as the neurosurgeon did before, at least I hope. So that means that today the question is, because local radiotherapy could induce some modification at the level of the subcortical connectivity, we should take into account dysfunctional anatomy. And to anticipate that if we irrigate, maybe you can also prevent, because it happened in some of my patients, but I cannot demonstrate that, of course, objectively using a prospective randomized trial, that there was a decrease of plasticity and then no possibility to re reoperate the patient, except, of course, you can accept a degree of uh, a deficit I cannot tolerate, but it's just my philosophy, and of course, the truth is just in between, not to be too oncologist or too functionalist. So to conclude, I would like uh, just uh, to have uh, a much more philosophical consideration because you know that uh, uh, the past 10 years uh, were uh, all very good uh, uh, from one approach uh, or uh, terrific uh, to my approach. I mean that today and not just for uh, um, administrating um, chemotherapy and the basis of just a 1P92 or IDH1, but also the abusive use of technology, you know, navigation, intraoperative MRI, robot, and so on. Show me just one paper demonstrated that you can increase both the median survival and the quality of life by using more technology or more genetics today in the management of patients with low grade glioma. It does not exist. So you have a problem because we can also consider that we have not the same brain and it will be much more complex because this brain will change from one patient to another one, but also in the same patient over time. That means that if you had one day to irradiate and re-irradiate 10 years later, probably the connectivity will not be exactly the same. And we start to take into account into the operating theater. We understood also that uh, we have to adapt to the quality of life of the patient. In other words, to say what I'm telling now to the patient and the family, and they will decide finally um, why not, according to what they want really. You have a chance to live 10 to 20 years, what do you want for the next life? And the goal is not just to avoid to be hemiplegic or aphasic, but also to preserve emotional process. Metacognition, we'll speak about that in the, in the next session, of course, because they have to anticipate, as you, especially younger people, what you would like to do for, to achieve for the next 20 years, to have a baby, to buy a house, uh, and so on, and not just, uh, okay, I would like to be alive. And according to that, I wrote recently a paper, I know that it will not be very politically correct, but uh, about uh, the evidence-based medicine, nonetheless, which will be published in Yarology because uh, it was refused in all three. I have tried all journal dedicated to oncology, and I sent to Neurology, which is a very good journal, of, and they said, yes, we have to publish that because it's just the truth, of course. We have to not forget the patient today. So you see that the truth is probably just in between. 
I mean, I continue to believe that we have to make the difference between precision medicine and personalized medicine in agreement with Hippocratic Hulk. It will be my last slide. Why? Because if you take into consideration the glioma location volume, kinetics, genetics, and your pathology, and so on and so on, it's just precision medicine. If you take into account the glioma, of course, plus the functional anatomy of the brain, plus the dynamics of the brain connectome, plus the needs of the patient, plus the modification of the behavior of the patient and yourself and science with 20 years of follow-up, then suddenly it's individualized medicine. This is the reason why my proposal would be to train here and the where young radiotherapists dedicated to irradiation of the brain, not only to the new methodology, proton therapy, IMRT, and so on, but also to the better knowledge of the natural history of the tumor. I think they start to know, but also to the functional anatomy of the brain, as we did this morning for neurosurgeons, especially in order to avoid to cut the connectivity. And I'm sure that we will have more integrated discussion during tumor board by telling, be careful because if you radiate here and this patient has a risk to have a modification of the behavior or attentional processing and according to its needs, I think it's not so reasonable. But if you radiate maybe here or if we are doing chemotherapy, we have a chance to induce plasticity, maybe using RTMS and so on and so on, and to irradiate a little bit earlier. Um, later or earlier sometimes, especially I am not uh, dogmatic uh, in patients with uh, intractable seizures due to an invasion of the Rolandic area. I know that uh, you can make the difference why I cannot remove completely Rolando. So my uh, um, question is, uh, is it possible to have this discussion regarding the next generation of radiotherapists in order for them to become cognitive neuroscientists as I have the habit to claim in uh, meeting of your surgery. Thank you very much. Discuss later. Thank you. Thank you, Katerina, for inviting me. Um, thank you, Hugh. Fantastic overview. And thank you for, for the influence you've been on our service in Leeds. Um, it's an honour to be invited to present at this meeting. We've had a low-grade glioma service in Leeds that was set up in about 2005. We've got an ongoing database. Obviously, of those 300 patients, there are a large proportion of those that have gone on to have adjuvant therapy. But as you can see from the slide, there is a wide team involved in looking after these patients. And it's not just about the neurosurgeon, it's about the oncologist, it's about the neurologist. Um, it's when it comes to the surgery, it's about the input we have from our allied health professionals, such as our speech and language therapy as well. Um, you know the standard indications for surgery. Um, we tend to practice now an asleep, awake, awake technique for our surgery. We used to put them back to sleep at the end of the awake phase, but we find that we actually get a better, faster recovery by keeping them awake through just the closure of the surgery, and they have a better, faster recovery and a shorter hospital stay. Um, yes, we are using technology, but we're not using it in place of the functional boundaries. Um, and we're doing regular follow-up scans. We do a first scan within 24 to 48 hours of the surgery. Um, just like is the normal procedure for a child with a tumour because that gives us the best idea of exactly what have we achieved through that surgery and for me as a surgeon it's fresh in my mind what I've just done so if I want to get a true indication of how much I've really got out 
um, having that early scan is a really helpful thing. And we tend to use that together with the three-month scan as our early baseline. Every patient is sent for neuropsychology. There are a few that are... They don't interact with that very well, um, and they don't always complete all their neuropsychology assessments. Some are quite struggling with the burden of the diagnosis, let alone the thought that they're going to have to have surgery and an awake craniotomy. So they don't always complete all their assessments, but we try as much as we can to get them for everyone. And we'll do visual field mapping as well as um, the more typical motor or speech mapping as well. Um, functional MRI, um, I think that's particularly useful for the motor mapping. Um, the speech I've found personally less reliable. We've, there's been times when we've told, been told, oh, speech is in that location by the tumor, tumor, and we found it in a different location during surgery. But sometimes, so that's motor, that's right hand on the screen, um, numbers two and one. I know they're back to front on the screen. It's to correlate with the scan. But there can be a very good correlation, like you can see there. And then we can do fancy things. Oh, it's not playing, sorry. Like doing the DTI as well as the... Um, as well as the bold um, cortical mapping as well. Um, and so we tend to have the setup, in, like you can see in theatre, with our navigation with the patient exposed so they can be monitored. And doing monitoring to look at exactly where we can safely resect. And in this particular patient, so at the front here, this is the functional MR told us that this is where speech was going to be. But in fact, it wasn't, it was up here. And I know there's debate about what exactly is Broca's area and things, but it, this is where the typical Broca's area speech was rather than down in the frontal operculum. So as you will have just been listening to, we, ha we are talking about a spectrum of disease, a disease that progresses over time. When does a grade two become a grade three? Well, technically it is, as soon as there is a focus of grade three tumor in it, it is classified as grade three or if there's a focus of GBM, that's classified as a grade four. But does a tumor that is 95% grade two and 3%, 5% grade three, does that behave the same as a tumor that is 100% grade three? Where, where do we draw these boundaries? And we know that the survival is different as well. But again, within the grade threes, are the better survivors those who are, for example, 20% grade three, 30% grade three, and the rest of it is grade two. Are those the better survivors? Have we actually looked at that? Have we looked at that in all these big international studies as well? How much of the tumor is going up the CUSA and being evaporated going up the sucker? How much is actually going into the lab as a block specimen? That's a really hard thing to work out. We had a series of six patients um, that we wrote up um, and finally managed to get published, um, accepted last year, published this year in World Neurosurgery. Um, if you want copies of the paper, um, I'm sure we can manage to distribute that. But we went through lots of different journals looking at this and saying basically what you're proposing is nuts. Um, we had a number of patients where, thanks to the influence of Professor Defoe, we identified that they were in the block of tumor that was sent, the majority of that tumor was grade two, but there was some grade three, and in one case, even a grade four, a GBM focus within it. And they started with observation. And that's part of the issue. What should we do? When should we bring in the radiotherapy, just as we've been hearing? So the first patient we treated was in November 2010. He had a large frontal tumor um, and had a large resection. But he did have a small bit of residuum that we were going to do a planned second resection. But because he had foci of grade three change within it, um, he was going to head to radiotherapy. But thanks to the influence we had, we sat down with him, had a further chat, and said, well, actually, shall we observe you closely in the first instance? He's now seven and a half years down from his first operation and has not yet had chemotherapy, radiotherapy. He is very aware that he is likely to need that at some point. But if he'd had the radiotherapy seven and a half years ago, now he'd be in that risk period for the cognitive decline that is reported and recognized with patients after radiotherapy. Okay, not everyone, but it is one of those risk factors. And where do we fit in the quality of life alongside the actual overall treatment of the patient? So we had this published as a proof of concept. Now, I've extended this a little bit because we've got a few other patients um, 
where they're now part of this cohort. And also with the WHO 2016 classification, we end up reclassifying a number of these patients from what we first looked at when we first started looking at these three and four years ago. Um, there's a large number of these that are oligodendroglioma with foci of anaplastic, of grade three olig anaplastic oligodendroglioma within them. The, the dates of their first operation are up on that slide in the middle of the slide. They're all male, their average age, me median age of 40 years, ranging from 20, 25 to almost 50 years of age. Um, and the range of follow-up so far with this group is two years to seven and a half. Um, we've had three reoperations. One was reoperated as a planned second stage procedure to remove tumor that was besides motor speech area. We've had two where they've had progressive signal change. One of those was a year after surgery, and I'll show you his pictures in a second. And actually, that was just gliotic tissue. We cut away all this signal change that was occurring on the scan. It was purely gliosis. We didn't expect that. Um, and then another one, we did have some further tumor growth three years down the line. But where he started off as being oligo with anaplastic oligo foci, what was removed at the second operation was purely oligo grade two, no high grade features, no anaplastic features within it, which is what Professor Defoe was just explaining for some of his as well. Similarly, for the astrocytomas, we've got three of these, they're all male. Um, the longest running one of these um, has actually now been referred and had radiotherapy because he's had a couple of areas of sm very, very small volume change, very, very small volume regrowth. He had one extra operation, then a few, about nine months later he had a bit more, and I'll show you his pictures. So this is our first patient, an index patient. He's a civil servant, um, and he had, this is his preoperative scan showing, there we go, showing his tumor with a few bits of faint enhancement within it. It doesn't project very well because of the light in the room. And he had a very nice extensive resection. But besides the speech area, he had some tumor residuum. And because he had grade three change within his tumor, he had a deliberate planned second resection. And that was the post-operative result. And that's his latest scan. I say latest, June 2017. He's due his next scan basically any minute now. And he remains symptom free. He's driving. He actually has to drive at high speed along our motorways. Um, working to basically catch criminals. And he's able to do that job, and his neuropsychology has shown a very minor decrease compared with his baseline preoperatively, but there has been no drop off in his performance at work. So he was oligodendroglioma at first operation with focus, foci of anaplastic. Um, no P10 loss or EG EGFR implication um, in either of the components of the higher, higher or lower grade tumor. Second operation, just grade two. This young man, in his mid-40s, he'd had a prior head injury. So on this scan, of course, one of the difficulties was how much of what we're seeing is head injury, how much is tumor. So the right frontal lobe, yes, that's tumor. And he has a craniotomy, debox it. But he had grade three change at the resection margin. So we then see this progressive change quite thick in a very short space of time. So we plan urgent surgery, re-resect, expecting that to come back as grade three tumor, needing radiotherapy afterwards. No, it was gliosis. It was cut out as a block of tissue, sent to the lab as a block of tissue, and it was gliosis. This is one of the other challenges. What are we treating if we see T2 signal change after surgery? If we haven't re-biopsied it, based on this experience, what are you actually treating? I know we're presuming it's tumor, but that was growing. That should have been tumor, but it wasn't. So he was grade two oligo, but grade three component up to the resection margin, and then just gliosis at the end of it. And this is a third one. I've not got them all on here for the sake of time, but again, his first operation, a nice big resection, and then a bit of gradual progressive change you can see growing along the deep margin of the resection cavity and has a further operation and he's now another three and a half years down the line um, and he's got a stable cavity with no further resection. I did have to leave some tumor in the deep margin just about here um, because that's where we were getting positive white matter stimulation for the corticospinal tracts. So again, 
first I have anaplasia in his first operation, no anaplasia in his second. This is the chap who had a grade, grade two um, astrocytoma, but he had a focus. I know we've got two foci of enhancement on the scan, but when the pathologist went through this as a block of tissue, they found a single focus of what they classified as being glioblastoma. But at his surgery, after his surgery, he still had a little residuum of tumor here. And given that pathology, we thought he had to go back for another operation. That operation was um, complicated by me injuring his draining vein of Labe, and he did end up with a posterior temporal um, infarct, um, as you can see on the scan. But he also had that further bit of tumor successfully resected. Three and a half years later, that was okay. But then, um, July 2016, he got that tiny little nodule that was resected. That was anaplastic um, astrocytoma, so that was grade three, and that was resected. And then, about nine to, tw nine to ten months later, we then saw some further changes indicated with the arrow on the scan with some further signal change in there. And yes, I could have gone back in and re-resected that, but that would have then been his fourth operation. And you do have to start questioning at what point. And on the basis that we'd had other change that I'd re-resected and was nodular recurrence of tumor, he's then been on for radiotherapy, um, trusting that that is tumor rather than gliotic, gliotic change. So yes, he's had a different course. And I think there is a difference between the astrocytomas and the oligodendrogliomas, and this is only a small number of patients. But this is a small number of patients in one institution. And if you take the experience of everyone across the room, there is going to be, we surely got other patients as well. One of the challenges is getting our oncology, getting our pathologists to look at big blocks of tissue and go through all of it and try and give us an estimation as to how much of that tumor is grade two versus grade three. Professor Defoe has just shown this slide where he's talking about the grade two plus tumors where they've got some microfoci of higher cellularity. We've got some of those where they, yes, again, they don't qualify for grade change. What about those at the other end? Should we have a grade three minus as well? Is there a case for a grade two plus? Is there a case for a grade three minus? Where in that spectrum are we? And what do we do as, an e as the EMGGN to actually as assess that further, try and get some answers to these questions as to when is the optimal time in terms of the patient's function and in terms of their quality of life as to when we actually do their further treatment. It's a large team involved. This isn't just one person. This is thanks to everyone. It's a very dedicated team focused around the patient. Um, a number of physiotherapists, AHPs, radio radiologists, radiotherapy, lots of different people involved. And so acknowledgement to the team who are all involved in treating these patients. And any questions?
So on the basis of that performance, and on the basis of the second tumour, which was then deeper parathyroid region, and moving a greater morbidity to try and accept it, he was then referred on from oncology for therapy. So it, it, it is a selected group. Um, within those are the those patients are the only ones where we have started with follow-up rather than referring them for treatment. We've got patients um, where we've had a 30% of grade three change in a background of grade two, where they have automatically been referred on just because of that volume. We've been uncomfortable with a volume of 30% grade three change, saying that has to be treated as a grade three rather than a grade two. But if you've got if you've got 100, 100 such patients together and 100 patients with pure grade three tumors, it wouldn't surprise me if the, the 100 with the 30% grade 3, 70% grade 2 would fare better. Because biologically, that would be suggested by that sort of mix within the tumour. So, yes, it's a, tiny, it's a tiny number of patients, and it is a, it's a flawed series from that point of view, but it's published as a, as a proof of concept to try and get people thinking and pr promote the debate, and actually to say to people, look, if you've got, series, if you've got similar numbers, why don't we try and look at them all, and why don't we try to see what common factors we've got? It's obviously really interesting about the women in particular who also have to identify those patients. Yeah. And that's going to be the difficulty. Yeah. So we really have to look at the second minister. Yes. I mean, we can go back and get into our database of patients who are three or three four. Yeah. And tumors that have four or three. Um, but how many that we intend to see in the population? And then how many, if we get our data perspective, how many are we going to be able to gather in teams that also push for other treatments and projects so I'm not more like, uh, willing to treat uh, that person? Yeah. So I think that uh, I told this is more the initiative, but I think we really have to think deeply about what we're going to treat those patients that we're going to present in the program. It has to be a perspective, I totally agree. The only way we get pathologists to look at the to look at the tumour accurately is at the time of doing the surgery. Once they've done, once they've taken their blocks and they've they've done whatever else they do with the tumour afterwards, they won't they won't be able to process it and give us the same information as they do if they do it prospectively. And it's got to be yeah, it's got to be a purposeful prospective study if it's done. Because of the of patients that have much more physical diseases that we have. 
There is a suggestion that NGNT could be more than this. In low grade glioma, we have no such indication. So the bottom line, very uncommon in low grade gliomas, no clear definition as to who actually gets it. We collected a series um, from four institutions to try and see if this was correlated with a negative outcome. Are these the patients that are transformed into high grade malignancies? Is that why it was a regression? There were too few patients, but we can see a trend in that direction. I have a question for Professor Mifu. Um, in your experience, is there a difference in the plasticity between um, the motor speech and the semantic system? If we are speaking definitely about the pre-work text example, you can have some degrees of reorganization, but um, not so much in the development of the problem of that way. In the world, this is a little more than an example of a different If you do a regular being in some part of area, which is definitely a nightmare for me, we publish paper in general in your side. I really like to say we are good, but to say, in fact, that we continue uh, to have in fact, table seizures in any of some cases when you are writing on patients in this area, why uh, they have been practicing seizures before. And this is the reason why in this case, quite far, you can help for us to clear the other thing you can because in fact, plasticity is not so much, so you do not treated the plasticity because it's the output of the minimum membrane. Now, regarding the semantic system, of course, plasticity is much more important because uh, more you have a higher level of cognitive function, more you can nonetheless uh, discover some uh, degrees of deficit according to a very extensive attack and examination, but nonetheless, uh, it will compensate thanks to higher form networking, uh, uh, redundancy, uh, redundancy uh, and so on and so on. So, what means is something also we are speaking about verbal, non verbal, uh, we will probably have more discussion about that in the next session. But that means that in this case, definitely we have to be careful when I uh, may be ready because uh, too early and maybe too early because uh, we have a risk uh, to induce a decrease of these mechanisms of plasticity or sometimes for new rays like this, I will say that also to be um, um, reasonable for such as because they could be tempted to replay after by uh, thinking that they will uh, have a perfect composition regarding their patients and find any new because uh, um, the ILF and the NCA have been cut, but the uh, IFO has been irradiated, and so that they can have some problems with their recent processing, despite the fact that you don't see the right answer, but not compensating everything. So you see, this is the reason why we have typically this kind of description all the way on the general board regarding uh, the anticipation of what I want to call the dynamic of uh, the cerebral uh, connectome according to the Atlas of brain plasticity we publish also because in fact in brain you have an atlas in the MMI complaint and everyone can use it, including for RFRP phone or such a way. I mean that uh, uh, you know that at this station, um, according to uh, the segmentation of this season and the number of voxels with uh, for each of them a degree of plasticity will recover or not. So this is exactly what we need to have in mind, at least in my opinion, in order to anticipate once again what will occur at least for the 15 years. I would like to add to that answer. Uh, so one of the challenges we face in the reality is what should be the board? What is the structure that we should avoid? You know, when you're treating a kidney, a kidney is a kidney, when you're treating a third a kidney, you're treating a third a kidney, you're treating a different effect because it's a volume effect. But is the brain the same? Is it just a volume effect? You're treating a third, you're treating two thirds? And the answer is, of course, not. Um, as I think many of you are probably aware, uh, we've run some clinical trials looking at uh, hippocampal appointments with the hypothesis being that the real sense of niche that resides in the hippocampus is neuro regenerative, especially for memory. <coughs> and as you're probably aware, the RK just completed a randomized trial. I cannot tell you the results. The results are now known. I can tell you that we're attending a certificate panel session uh, abstract that's known. So 
وتصورون السن ده انا مش فاكر اذا هم بالظبط وصلنا في الدنيا. But that sort of underscores the fact that understanding the functionality of various subcomponents of the brain for radio sensitivity is crucial. Uh, one of my colleagues, Matt Hall, just received a grant to get a radiation oncologist to take a group of 60 children getting radiation back to the brain will be assessed functionally and cognitively and prospectively, but we also, all of them, will have DTM imaging performed through the entire course of therapy, and then create a model to see if there's a radiation sensitivity that is fiber track specific. And so we're trying to create a close long analysis model for the plasticity <coughs> and the radiation sensitivity <coughs> of various fiber tracks. This is the kind of work that allows us to avoid certain specific regions and target others, making the eventual outcome of the patient that we have. Legs, Yeah, 
Finally, it's totally independent of the molecular biology. Of course, it's better even in our series to be statistically with uh, uh, 1p 9q codilated, as I said, because you have 19 years of uh, median survival rather than 15 years with astrocytoma, but nonetheless, it's 50 years. So, no, I totally disagree with that, and the problem with that, I started to see surgeon doing a biopsy now, telling finally the pattern is not so good, and finally I will not go to the OR. It's totally crazy. And then I do surgery a posteriori by removing the tumor and following just the patient. So I think we should really finish. And uh, we're going to well, listen to Thank you very much. Now, I guess that we are, uh, we are going to have the, the great pleasure of hearing Dr. Monica Hagee. She's uh, uh, one of the pillars of uh, what we decide now in modern neuro-oncology. Everybody knows uh, her work, and uh, so we are going to hear her on epigenetic vulnerabilities of low-grade gliomas, biomarkers, and new opportunities. Cells are actually different from each other and make up um, 
the different organs that we have or make um, changes possible. And also be between identical twins, what is different is the epigenetics, something which is adaptive and, and, and changes. But I will only talk about a very small part of, uh, of epigenetics. And as you can see on this slide, it shows different uh, mechanisms that are involved in epigenetics. You see here the, um, the DNA that is, on, um, is rolled on the, on the histones. And um, I will be talking about mainly about the, the methylation changes on, on, the, on the DNA. Um, that is, that is a means um, of, that is different depending on the cell of origin. And it also changed during, during um, tumor development. And low-grade glioma is characterized to have a dramatic change in, in DNA methylation. And that's why we think it's very important to look at this stage for, um, for new uh, targets or also for markers to um, predict the outcome of the patients. So here is, is just um, the scheme. What we know, where we have a direct effect of the methylation on gene expression, which then mediates the function in the, in the, in the cells. And here um, it shows the, the methylation of, of promoter, that in normal tissue, the, the promoter, CPG islands of promoters are not methylated. You have an open chromatin, and the, 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 the genes are expressed, while um, outside you have lower um, you have methylation and there is a compacting of the, of the chromatin. While um, there are tumor suppressor genes that are known that are methylated in, at the promoter in tumors, which gives a compacting, compacting uh, of the chromatin and there is loss of expression. And probably the, the best known in, this, uh, in, in our field is, is MGMT. Uh, that when it is inactivated, it um, sensitizes the cells um, to be killed by thermosolomide. While the, the normal tissue is actually um, protected. So this, this methylation uh, patterns of, of the DNA can also be used for, for more than that. Here you see um, a methylation analysis of this glioblastoma because in this, in this way it doesn't um, it's more difficult to find uh, in the literature for, for lower grade gliomas, but you can see um, in the upper part there are differences in these methylation patterns. You see in red higher methylation and in blue is this low methylation and at the bottom of the, the slides you see the different glioblastoma subtypes and I think we can easily identify here these, these are the ones that are IDH mutant and you can see this really particular pattern of methylation. And so this IDH mutation um, leads to a methylator phenotype. And this is very important in low-grade glioma because all the IDH mutants have such a, a phenotype. And so it is not surprising that you, if, if you look at the differences be between different subtypes of glioblastoma that have different methylation patterns, which is a, is a mixture of, um, of cell of origin type of methylation and a change in the tumor type of methylation. And if we put this all together, you can use this to classify the tumors. Actually here you can see, the, uh, it is shown here for glioblastoma, with this, this was one of the first steps in this direction. Uh, with this they could see that these different patterns of methylation, they go together with different types of methylation in, um, in genes which are relevant in epigenetic alterations and they affect different um, glioblastoma subtypes, which are also present in different locations are, um, and are developing at different ages of the patients. So this is kind of all, all interlinked. Uh, this is what gave the basis in order to give the new classification, at least for the, for the lower grade, uh, for the gliomas. Here is the uh, WHO classification and uh, high here it is highlighted um, that the CPG island phenotype in the, in the lower grade glioma, here we have the, the non-codeleted and here we have the codeleted that have this, this methylator phenotype and then on the left side you have the, um, the glioblastoma. 
On this side, actually, you cannot see the non-IDH um, non mutant um, lower grade gliomas because they are basically at this point very undefined. So we don't really know what they are. We just know that they are not IDH mutant. And I think something which is also important to see that if you look at MGMT methylation, the presence of MGMT methylation <laughs> is present basically in 100% of the oligodendroglioma and 90% um, of um, the non codeleted IDH mutant um, low grade glioma. What is important um, to but what I want you to remember, um, MGMT is located on chromosome 10. As you can see in, in, in glioblastoma, chromosome 10 is lost in basically all cases. While this is not the case in low-grade glioma, and this has some importance later on in my presentation. So what I show you here is the, is the world map of um, of DNA methylation that is used for classification of, um, of brain tumors. So this is the, the Heidelberg version of methylation analysis for the classification. With this, they can classify 82 different um, subtypes. And I show you here, um, here you have the, the IDH wild type glioblastoma, and here you have the IDH um, mutant glioma. And you can see in the methylation space, they're very far apart from each other. So these are really different diseases that cannot be put together. And with this, they basically, they have a fairly good, uh, consistent uh, way of, um, of classifications. There are certainly some doubts with it, but um, it's, it's, it's probably a new way of uh, doing it in a, in a very um, systematic manner. We have to see where this will lead us, um, but we will certainly have discussions over time um, whether this is useful and how um, reliable it is. But I think where I want to get at in this, in this methylation changes that we have, there are genes affected that um, take part in all the hallmark, hallmarks of, of the cancer development. And since in, in low-grade glioma we have so many changes, um, most likely there must be some um, genes altered that are potent, where the pathway afterwards can be targeted um, to this alteration. And um, so therefore, we, we went out to look at the, um, our low-grade glioma study from the ERTC, the 22033, that has been presented by Minish before, um, where we were looking um, at, at this um, methylation to see what, whether, whether we can see something more. Here, I just summarize you the, um, the, the trial again. Um, I think something which is important to note is that the patients they were actually randomized at the time when they needed treatment, and the treatment um, was initiated um, depending on um, high-risk criteria, which means the entering into the trial depend was, was very different from one patient to the other, which makes all the analysis quite difficult, and the associations of markers is very difficult, of course. So this is a difficulty for our side. But of course, um, it's the patient who is in the center of the question. And um, I don't have to re remind you that the, there was no difference in progression-free survival of, um, between the two treatment arms. Um, here is just something I want, would like to highlight. You have the, the three different subgroups. Um, and I would like to show the, the, the difference in age. So the, the youngest, the youngest group, let me show it with the, with the um, arrow here. The youngest group are the non-codeleted. And um, as not surprisingly, the oldest are the ones with um, IDH uh, wild type um, low-grade glioma. Then what is interesting, the time from, rese from resection to, um, to um, the randomization in the treatment was, was longest for the non-codeleted, so they, in the, the median was nine months after the, they were um, resected, they were entered. This was shorter for the codeleted, and this was even more short for the, for the IDH wild type. And here again, I show you at the bottom that um, basically that all of the um, IDH um, codeleted were um, methylated, 
and it was 50% for, for the wild type. This is similar what you would expect for, for um, glioblastoma. So here um, you see the, the outcome. So this is the, um, um, the prognostic information that you have uh, depending on the subtype. I think it's nothing, no, nothing spectacular. And you hear that you, in the different uh, subgroups um, where we see that in the, um, the non-codylity it seems that the, um, the effect of temozolomide is, is less important than for, for, um, for a radiotherapy. So um, we, from, this, um, from this study, we were able to, um, to do an, a methylation analysis for, for over 130 cases. And um, here you just see, the, again, the methylation profile. And uh, what you can hear, um, you here have the, all this, the different samples. And here in green on the, on the left side, where you see there is no methylator phenotype, these are the IDH wild head tumors, so it is very small proportion. And I think overall it was, uh, it was uh, 15 um, in, in this, in this um, subgroup here. And you can see if you order by, um, by methylation, this already can also identify here are the, these are the um, codeleted tumors. So basically this information is already comprised in the methylation profile. Um, I just, since I have this data, we have used this um, methylation profiles and we have submitted it to the classification from Heidelberg. And um, you, we can see here we have, the, these are the IDH mutant uh, tumors, the, and here are the, the codeleted, and then we have some that are considered to be high-grade um, IDH mutant tumors. And then here we have some that are considered glioblastoma, and all of them are um, um, the IDH wild type. So it's kind of like it's not, not really a surprise. And some of them were um, considered to be normal con uh, tissue from the contralateral side of a tumor. This is, they had some normal tissues in their analysis. So this was more close to that. Whether we have infiltration zone in this analysis is another question. So then we, we went out to see, are there any differences in the methylation um, of pathways that are of potential interest of cancer? And on the left side, you have the ERTC uh, population. On the right side, the, the low-grade glioma uh, population from TCGA. And you can see in the, on the left side, which is the, the codeleted, um, you have higher methylation in, in some of these pathways that are of potential interest. I think, for example, DNA repair, apoptosis, P53 pathway. Um, you can see um, we have so many differences, so it would be very difficult to have like, um, in, um, relevant information because we would be killed by multiple testing correction. Therefore, we decided to go another way and to, um, to restrict our analysis to just one um, pathway, which is DNA repair. And we also wanted to use only functional methylation since we wanted to have predictive factors, things where we know that if there is a change in methylation, there is also a change in function. And for this, uh, we used the information from TCGA because there we is uh, um, methylation and expression available where we can say if there is a change in, if we have um, high methylation, we should see low expression. And we were looking, here are just the, the major pathways in DNA repair that are of potential interest. And the, the choice was because um, the patients have been treated with temozolomide and radiotherapy, which certainly, um, where DNA repair is certainly of importance. And the functional gene would be, um, I just show you um, how, this, how this works. Um, this is the, um, this is the model for, for a gene. Here it is RDM1, which is one of the repair genes. Um, here you have the, the, the methylation or the, the CPGs in the gene. And here in green, this is the area where, where there is the, the CPG island in the promoter. And in red, you have the methylation of the, that is measured on this chip um, at the CPGs. In red is the tumors, and in green is normal. And um, so we wanted to have something where the, when in normal there is no methylation, so this, it is high methylation in the tumor. And, um, oops, this, this was wrong. 
And um, at the, this, at he, down here, here is the correlation with expression. So we're looking for negative expression. And if we had a negative correlation of minus 0.3, we would, this, we would only look at these probes because they are we, what we called functional. This is functional methylation. And the cutoff of minus 0.3, <coughs> with this, we would also be able to fish uh, MGMT because this is always for us is something that we know and we always look at that. So here are the, here are all the, the functional um, CPGs that we have identified. And you can see you get really a very structured um, um, heat map. And you, um, let me see. and you can see that there are blocks. And this is because a CPG in a given, for a given gene will, is very highly correlated. So that they more or less behave the same way. And on the right side, you see that the, the associated genes um, for, for this um, um, that are represented here, and here you see some of the some of, some of the genes that are located on one of, uh, on chromosome 1p and uh, on 19q, because you can imagine if you have if you have loss of 1p 19q and you methylate the other one, you basically have killed the, 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 the function of the gene in your tumor. So this would be part particularly um, attractive. So it would be very similar as in G as MGMT in GBM, where you lose one chromosome copy of 10, and um, you methylate the, the other allele. So th this is the, the complete list. And so we have two genes that are um, on 19Q and 1P that are potentially interest uh, for, for that reason. And actually, in um, mTOR, targeting in, in a low-grade uh, study is already ongoing. So we, at some point, we will have some information um, if this is, is of interest. So um, here I show you um, the, the genes that we have identified that have um, functional methylation and is projected on the, all the different um, pathways. So basically found um, functional methylation in 24 genes, uh, the, um, repair genes out of 410 that are represented on the methylation chip. But you can see we, uh, we don't get um, um, a particular pathway that would be overrepresented here. And uh, here I, sh I show you, um, actually it should be, I should probably go f like this. So we, we found, um, when we, we, we wanted to associate now the, the dysfunctional genes with outcome to see which ones are actually um, prognostic or, or better, we only were, in, were only interested in predictive um, um, genes. And um, we found seven CPGs, which belong to four genes. And um, the top one is, is MLH3 with three CPGs. The second one is MGMT. And then two other ones, two other repair genes. The two MGMT uh, probes that we found were the same that we use for a predictor of glioblastoma. So it's kind of like it's not a surprise uh, that this uh, shows up here. And um, just to give you some background, so that, um, actually um, the association was um, predictive to be um, associated with outcome in the radiotherapy arm was RAT21. This is a gene that is known to be involved in double strand um, repair and haploid insufficiency has been um, reported to enhance radiosensitivity in a mouse model. SMC4 is part of a um, so-called com condensing complex one and two, which is um, essential for chromosome assembly and segregation, and is also known to uh, play a role in double strand um, repair. MLH3 is cancer relevant. It's of unclear function. Um, it is always called an MM mismatch repair um, pathway member, but actually it's dispensable for this, for this function. And then on, on the only one that is predictive for um, response to temozolomide was MGMT in this analysis. Uh, but I have to say, uh, we, multiple test, none of these um, markers uh, passed multiple testing correction. And since any repair gene will have an effect, so it's, it's always exciting to see it, but of course it's, um, 
Um, you need, we need to put a lot of in information behind in order to convince ourselves that they are really relevant and potentially druggable um, for, for low-grade glioma. Since you know much more about MGMT, we looked a little bit in more detail for, for MGMT. And um, here you see the, um, the multivariate model. And you can see um, that MGMT or, or treatment on its own is, is not significant, but it's, it's a combination, so it's the, the predictive value. Here we, we correct it for, um, for the codeletion status but the, um, there was no difference in the effect um, on the treatment whether we had um, the codeletion status in it or not. So the EMGMT was overriding um, the codeletion status at least in this population that are, we have been looking at. So we then were looking at this MGMT score because what we, are, what we are, have been associating survival now is not being methylated or unmethylated, I told you, Basically, all of the low-grade gliomas are methylated. Here we look at the extent of methylation, and this is what I show you here. Um, here you have high, um, high methylation of, of MGMT, and these are the, the three different subgroups. Um, you have here, the, this is the codeleted, the non-codeleted uh, IDH mutant, and here, here are the IDH wild type. And you can see the, um, the IDH uh, mutant codeleted, they have a higher extent of methylation in general, but there, is, there are big overlaps. And this is true for, for the ERTC data set, TCGA1 and TCGA2, so we split TCGA data in two in order to have a test and a validation set. So this is, this is the same. So a higher extent of methylation um, in, in, the, in, the, um, in the codeleted. And when we, then we, when we look um, at expression levels of MGMT and high extent of methylation, you can see there is, there is a correlation. And so the more you are to the right, the, the higher methylation you have, the lower is the expression, which is kind of like an expected result, of course. But this kind of like is maybe the reason why we have, um, why we have this effect. And you have to remember, in, in low-grade glioma, we have two copies of MGMT. And if we, if we see methylation, we, can, we, we don't know per se whether we have inactivation of both. But if we have a high methylation, it's more, it is more likely that we inactivate both of them. And that's why we, we think that we see this effect, um, that we see an effect at high methylation levels. And here, um, what I show you here is a three-dimensional um, Kaplan-Meier curve. And you can see the, the MGMT score in this direction. And um, here in the, the color code is, is the, um, the, the percentage of um, progression-free survival. And to make it a little bit more, more easy, so this is in the radiotherapy arm and the temosolomide arm. And so um, in, to make it more easy, um, Pierre has put um, uh, the first and the third quartile. In the radiotherapy arm, it doesn't make a difference whether you have high methylation or low methylation. While in the temosolomide arm, if you have high methylation, you do significantly better than if you have, if you have low methylation. So it, the extent of methylation makes a difference um, for, for, for the outcome of the patients in, in the radiotherapy arm. Uh, no, in the temsolomide arm, sorry. So it's predictive. So with this, I uh, would like to summarize. Um, so we found that 24 um, repair genes that were functionally methylated, and there are five candidates that um, may indicate treatment options. I didn't go into this in detail here. Um, <coughs> Methylation in four genes was associated with outcome um, either in the temosolomide or the radiotherapy arm. Um, and the MGMT score or the extent of methylation was associated um, with outcome in the temosolomide arm. And we think that, um, this effect is probably because we need to in inactivate both uh, MGMT alleles and the score um, MGMT test and does cannot tell you whether it's one or two. It, we, we can only look at, at the extent. So these results certainly need uh, validation, but I think this, this score 
could provide a tool in the future in order to decide how to treat patients. So if you have a large radiation free field, you might say, okay, we try a uh, temozolomide first if you have a high um, uh, methylation score. But most likely in the, many, in the many genes that are methylated in low-grade gliomas, we should be able to find some other potential targets. And uh, here just the people who have been involved. Um, so it was Pierre Betty here in the back who did the, all the calculations and the bioinformatic analysis. And Sebastian Kurscheid, he did, uh, he did the analysis. And of course, it's the, it's the, this has been done in the URTC. And um, Brigitte Baumert was the principal investigator and Roger Strupp were the co-investigator. So this was a very close um, collaboration. Thank you very much for your attention. But I think this is always that this is always the double side its word because any um, I mean with radiotherapy and, and temosolmine, that's what you aim at. You want to make as many mutations in the DNA as possible because with the hope that you this kills your cells. This is basically the principle of our treatments. And of course you can also with this uh, maybe um, provoke to get mutations which then are uh, which then afterwards are uh, promoted out. So this is this I think it goes with it. Do you have enough events on the trial to tease that out? I don't think so. I mean, we have, we have a very small group. Um, you mean, you mean for, for the mutations or what? Try and actually get a mutator phenotype for who undergoes dynamic <coughs> Well, um, for this, we would need to have the, the at, at recurrence, you would need to collect those which we, which we want to do. But I think the numbers of free resections, you know, the, the, the small numbers of samples that we have, this will be greatly reduced. And I think the, the methylator phenotype, um, the mutator phenotype, I think, is expected to be in the range of 10% or something like that. So. Um, if I may. Well, it seems to me that. Uh, just the methylation status of MGNT is not very easy or and to do, and uh, not people, not all people use the same methods across uh, labs. And and uh, if that's the case, just for the to determine whether there's a uh, methylated status, what about the the extent of methylation? <laughs> so actually. Um <laughs> This methylation assay is part of, the, you can get this from the same chip for which you, um, that is used for the Heidelberg um, um, classifier. And um, basically that's, this is the reason why we can also do it in TCGA, because we, it is, you can annotate it using the, the model that Pierre by before my laboratory has, has done. And actually when you, when you send your sample to Heidelberg, they will also give you the, the MGMT um, result. And we see that the, you can see the score on, on the on the report. The score. So, so, so this is now set up for 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 that At essay. Least. So because okay. it's, it's it's a quantified essay, but what we have not done is is kind of like the decision from when on would you would you decide to, to treat. We just show that the, there is the extent makes a difference, and then afterwards, of course, it's it's a, a clinical question what you what you where you make a cutoff in order to decide one way or another. Yeah, and it has to be validated in clinical, in terms of clinical outcome, I suppose. Well, I mean, what, um, this is what we have shown. When to we decide, have no yeah. validation set because there is, there is no other clinical trial that is, uh, mm -hmm. data exists. So. 
And um, in this time of uh, genetic uh, therapies, is there any way that you can induce an hypermethylated phenotype in tumors? That you can do what? Induce uh, hypermethylation through uh, some uh, genetic manipulation or something like that? Yes, indeed, there are like this, 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 this CRISPR, you can, you can add a second enzyme and then you, you can start to, to methylate um, uh, promoters um, in a design way. So. But first of all, you need to be able to put this into the tumor. Um, you, you, you have, as usual, you have to be able to reach uh, your target. And uh, we hope that the, the tumor has been cut out completely, so there is this way. <laughs> <laughs> to run after those uh, cells that are kind of um, have evaded from the, from the central part. Thank you. Any more questions? Thank you very much, Dr. Aggie. Thank you all. <laughs> this is awesome.